everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And today I am so excited because I have an amazing guest. He is the creator of Carnival on HBO. And he is a writer who is a writer and a producer on The Blacklist and NBC. Please welcome the amazing, incredible genius, Daniel Knopf. Hi there. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Daniel? Um, I'm doing pretty good. I'm just, uh, just chilling. Just chilling. Trust against the deadline. That's, <laughs> you know, trying to get it done. Right? Yes. Don't we all? We're all trying to get it done, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, so you're always wondering. It's like, uh, am I taking this note too literally? Does this work? Does this, does this work at all? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and every time it's some so stupid. I'm like, yeah, you know, Charlie Brown comic strip it was like Lucille or Lucy, and she's got the football, and it's like every single time, I think I'm gonna turn this thing in, and they're gonna be so knocked out by it <laughs> that they will just they'll just have no notes for me. <laughs> <laughs> what an idiot I am. <laughs> <laughs> And it's every time. I mean, it's every Oh, yeah, I know the other times. That was bullshit. But this time, for sure. For That's sure. what it is. They'll, they'll see that my hand was guided by God. Like every single, <laughs> every single sentence is like a little pieta. It's Jesus. You know? yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's That's how artists feel. You know, we feel like we are just creating a masterpiece. And of course, yeah, they have yeah, no. the only question is a masterpiece of what? No. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, yeah. And there's times it, this one, this one's, this one's hard because it's, it's actually about Jesus. I'm writing about, um, it's a project called The Rising. Uh huh. Um, and it, and so there's this element of it that's really, I mean, the whole process of writing is is kind of supernatural, at least as far as I'm yeah. concerned. I mean, I don't know. I guess there's guys out. I, I guess there's people out there where it's like pure craft, and there's always craft to it. But um, I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, those those big seminars. I won't name names, but we all know who the you know who they are. And you pay like a jillion dollars to spend a weekend watching, you know, Casablanca for twenty, you know, yeah, you know, where where it's like they're they're just you know they're teaching you the three act structure and mm -hmm. going through you know plot point number one and plot point number two, and if you go to this, um, you'll be able to write a screenplay. Well, it's just absurd because what what those are is they teach you this if you were a painter. They'd be teaching you how to stretch a canvas. So it's like, well, so if you know how to stretch a canvas, you can paint the Mona Lisa. And it's like, no, you just can't, you, know, you just came up with like a decent surface to paint on, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, and, and it was it was weird because the first day of this it was weird because this particular one I went to this is a long time ago. It's like, you know. Um, uh, you know, you had these people who had clearly been more than once. And really what it is, it's for executives so that they can talk about screenplays as if they know anything about the process. And it, if they really knew the process, they'd be terrified. They'd never hire anybody because the process is magical. The process, the process it really is. is, I mean, what, what it, I, I, I mean, it's like there's, I can't, I mean, what you do is you sit there and you go, you, you, you know, what you learn in the first 10, 15 years you do this, the process is learning how to get out of your own way, you know, and and uh, stop looking down at the top of the stick shift to figure out where, you know, first and second and third and fourth. It's you, where you just, you, you where you understand that you just have to open yourself up and, mm -hmm. and the story kind of bubbles up through what I call a story well. And your story well is everything you've experienced, every every everything, every movie you've ever seen, every thing that's ever happened to you, every tragedy that's unfolded for you, every, you know, every victory you've ever had, everything, 
everything you've ever experienced. I mean, the, the taste of watermelon to uh, you know what it's like to get dumped. You know, I mean, yeah. and everybody's story well is like a fingerprint. Uh, it's, it, each person, nobody's had the same experiences, and so it's absolutely unique. And then something else bubbles up through that story well, and it's it's transmitted into onto the page, you know, and and and, uh, and I don't know where that sh I don't know where that shit comes from. I mean, I I sit there, I go, who wrote this? I, I mean, where did that? Oh my, God. you t it's it's like it just yeah. flows. I, I I it's like just. I, I, I know it's gross, but it's like vomiting, you know? It's like, I know well, it's so gross, but it's almost like it's we're like. We're taking a really good shit. We, let's just go there. But, uh, no, but seriously, I, it's like it just comes through, right? And you're like, yeah. you're looking, I'm like, I wrote this? Like, how? Where did this come from? Yeah, well, it, for, for me, my, my process is really my process. I really didn't understand how to write characters until. I I had one of my mentors was this really great guy named Cliff Osman who since has passed away, um, and he was a he was an acting coach, and I met Cliff because he was Armand Desante's acting coach, and Armand was in like the first movie anybody ever made from one of my scripts. It was called Blind Justice for for HBO way back in. Oh yeah, that was the first one you sold, right? Is yeah. That, yes. And so, and so I, I was, you know, I was out on set a lot and I was talking to Cliff and he said, I said, I mean, I think I want to be a director. I mean, I, at the time I thought I'd write my way into the director's chair and that's what I wanted to do. And, yeah. uh, and so I thought, you know, it'd probably be helpful for me to learn a thing or two about acting, you know, just cool. so I can communicate with, with, you know, with performers. Right. And so, I said, look, would you mind if I took your class? And he taught this class up in Studio City or Burbank. So I think it was in Burbank, yeah, and, and, or North Hollywood. Yeah, it was in North Hollywood. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was that thing where, you know, Wednesday night you'd go in, he'd hand you, hand you a script, and then you'd do a cold on stage. And then you'd, next week you'd be off book, and he'd give you notes on your performance in the third week they tape it and then the fourth week we would all watch the tape and critique it and um i never really i learned i learned about acting i learned about the process but i i, I couldn't really get over um my uh my stage fright I, I just couldn't successfully build that fourth wall i was always aware of the audience and, and so for me acting being on stage and acting was like those flying dreams where you know you're flying and yeah you're going, holy cow i'm flying this is great wait a minute i can't fly and then you drop like a stone and that'd be like me acting i'd be in the moment i'd be like i i'd forget all my lines but they'd be coming out of my mouth and i'd be totally into it and i'd be going oh look i'm acting I'm <laughs> and all of a sudden then just the whole performance would just fall apart and uh <laughs> <laughs> and what I what I learned, I think for a dramatist, and it's unique to be a dramatist. I don't think it's true of like novelists or poets or other types of writers. But if you're, you know, there's a reason why Shakespeare started as a performer, you know. And um, I tell young writers, it's like the best writing class you can take as a dramatist is to take acting classes. And I don't care whether you're scared to get on stage and how shy you are and how how you know demented and neurotic you are. Um, so this is where you're going to learn how to write drama, right. and 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 you learn. Um, yeah, what I found out was is I was scared on stage, but I'm alone when I write. So there there is no fourth wall to build. It's right over that way. You know? So, um, <laughs> yeah. and so all it is is, is you're just improving, and he, I mm -hmm. mentally put myself in the space. I, I don't see a screen and see people talking on a screen in front of me. I'm literally in the scene, sitting at the table with the actors and I, with the with the characters rather, and I, I know what everybody wants, you know. The, and one of the first things you learn in acting is what do you want? What is what is the best outcome for you? Even though you know from the script that isn't the outcome in the script, what are you going for? And then Cliff would always be, you know, what do you want? You know, how are you going to get it? Do what you need to do to get it. And 
and different characters, different people play different cards. And so um, you very rarely, you know, the, if people spit out the truth at the top of the scene, um, it, it's usually because it's a crappy scene. It's, it's mm -hmm. melodrama. And, and people generally don't tell the truth, um, at least the emotional truth, um, right. unless they're pressed up against a wall. And, and so you have to put them through their paces. So first they got to try the passive aggressive card. If that doesn't work, then they move over to the bullying card. And if that doesn't work now, it's the guilt card. And with each card a person plays, the first card they play is always the winner card. That, that's good for them 90% of the time and it gets a job done. But if that card doesn't work, and maybe they got a backup card, once they get to like the third or fourth card, most people don't have anything left to play but the truth. And that is, look, the reason I'm asking you for, for, for money is because my entire my entire business is a sham and it blew up and, I, and I'm, I'm about to go to jail, you know? Um, <laughs> you gotta get to a lot of cars. Or if you, you know, you know I, 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 I don't love you anymore. Um, you gotta go through a lot of cards. It's not you. <laughs> you know, it's me. It's, it's me. <laughs> you know, you have to go through all the bullshit cards to get to yes, to the truth. Yeah. yeah, and and that's what your characters have to do. But, Absolutely. But anyway, I, I just flew all over the place. I guess I guess what I was saying was the story kind of becomes. You know, I'm in there and I'm just transcribing it. It's just and I, I tell people, yeah, it's weird because people go to church and and and. You know, again, I'm writing about you know Jesus, so I've kind of got my head in, yeah. in Catholicism and so forth, and and people go to church, and uh, to me, the only people who are, you know, artists are in touch with the supernatural like every day. We, I, oh my, God, thank we, you for saying that. Yes. Yeah. So we're Art. so we're we're hearing voices, and we're yes, we're we're we're, we're I mean we're. We're certifiably insane. In, we really are. And yeah, you, you know, when you're writing and when you're in that process. When so. I absolutely, absolutely, and and we notice things like uh, the other day I was with a friend in a car, and you know we came from somewhere, and there was a sign that related to me in my head. It was like related to what just happened, where we came from, and it's almost like I relate things. I don't know if you do this. Like I think artists yeah. be patterns of things or we relate things that are not related and we have some kind of magical thing well, yeah, yeah and you have to explain the whole thing it's like it's, it's like you're driving past you see like uh it's like like a combo of uh you know a billboard and then a bus bench underneath it and you burst out laughing because it's just you know the two together equals something yeah. funny and you, and somebody looks at you like you're bad you're like what are you insane and you have to go oh no 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 it's see Let's see the bus bench. It says this and see that, and they and then they burst out laughing. Hopefully, yeah. Um, but yeah, your mad pattern recognition, you know, this mad pattern recognition going on, and and uh, yeah, I remember I took the I took the Minnesota multiphasic personality test one time. I was 26 and I was going through this vicious depression at the time when I was younger. Oh, yeah. I used to used to really struggle with chronic depression, and um, talk my way out of it. Mm. I finished mm. therapy. Actually, you talked yeah. yourself out of it. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know what it's like to finish therapy? You tell the therapist, you know, I think I'm done here. You know, and the therapist, yeah. oh, okay, let's talk about it. So then you talk about it for another year, and then you're done. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but it was like I was I was, I was really going through this this this. this you know this crazy depression. So I take they give me this Minnesota multiphasic personality test, and she gets back and she goes, "I want to go over this with you." I said, well, "What is it?" Just, it seems to indicate here that you're schizophrenic. What? And you go, "Really?" And she says, "Yeah." And she says, "I said, well, let's just touch on the questions and sort of touch on that. And I'll see if I miss." And one of the questions was like a big giant schizo red flag was, do oh you God. see things other people don't see? And of course I wrote, yeah, all the time. I see shit. Yes. You, <laughs> you know, and, but not literally, you know. And so I was, so, but yeah, we, we do. We see things people don't see. We put things together. You, 
you grow, you know, you see, you know, you're sitting there and you're just struggling with a scene and all of a sudden you see um, a, 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 an old woman walking down the street with an umbrella in a, on a sunny day and you go, oh my God, that's it. And then you run back and, you know, it's, it's these weird things. It's just yes! unlocked. Oh my God, moment, totally. You know? Yes. It's uh, like a sign, like signs everywhere. Yeah. Like I'm thinking you just, about something and then yeah. I have the answer on a sign. Uh, exactly. I and like I said, you just you have to get out of your own way to see this stuff, and that's not something you can learn how. It, you no. can learn how to do it. It's mostly it's mostly about unlearning. Yes. You're learning. You're unlearning all the things. It's like when you're a child, and you, you when you're a child, your mom says, "Hey, can I have a cookie?" And your mom says, "You can have a cookie in fifteen minutes, but I'm busy." And you know, it's like 15 minutes. Holy shit. 15 minutes? Are you nuts? I could die in 15 minutes. <laughs> when they say, oh, when's Christmas? Oh, it's not for another nine months. It's like nine months. Are you not? And now, I mean, my age, it's just like pff, nine months. It's like dip. <laughs> There it is, nine months. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Before you say months is there, yeah. Yeah, but the reason yeah. for that, as we get older, the reason that time passes so quickly is Why? because we see stuff. And so we filter it out because we've already seen it. So we really only become aware of new stuff. You know what I mean? And, yes. And so that's what, you know, a long day is a day where you're confronted by a bunch of challenges you've never been confronted by. Yeah. So it's like, oh, my God, today we just went on and on and on. And it, that's because you were, you, were, you were challenged in that day, probably. Or you experienced something like, God, I went and got a tattoo. I've never done that before. That was really weird, you know. And um, that took two and a half hours of, like, low-grade pain. <laughs> I paid for it. It's strange. Um, but it, you, you know, that's, that's, it, it's just that we, we mark time by what we notice in the, and a lot of people just fall asleep at about eh, 22, 23 years old. They're more than halfway there. By the time they're 30, they're, they're practically in a coma, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and so the time just sort of flies by. You know? Absolutely. Do you think also artists would feel differently also like what like when i see the sign i get emotional because it's it's almost like the answer to what i'm thinking about i see it in a sign or i see it in an image somewhere on the street like oh yeah sign. yeah you get you, know? goofy. you get goofy you get like giddy it's like yeah know, i know i love like Jack and frankenstein but it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> you know um but yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it can be it can be highly charged. It's like I, I can't get to my my laptop fast enough, um, and you know, it's 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 an adventure. The whole process is is you're looking inside yourself. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're looking outside yourself through inside yourself. I mean, David Bowie's last album, uh, uh, Black Star, I think. It's, uh, and he says that the center of the universe is your eyes. Now you could say interpret that as a very very romantic. If it was like maybe a a, 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 a nineteen year old David Bowie, he might say he's he really likes his girlfriend's eyes, you know. But I don't think that's what he meant. I think that that the that each person's universe is at the center of that is your eyes and what you're seeing in and what you're experiencing. And so I think as an artist, you, you're trying to connect, you're, tr you're trying to, you have this, you have these powerful things that, that impact you in a very specific emotional way. Yes. And you want to convey those. Yes. And those don't come from, you know, you can go to a movie, you can cry. And you can dupe that scene, but it's not going to be convincing because the guy who wrote that scene was writing from experience, probably. Okay. Right. And, and so that's that's really why so much today on TV, especially and in film, is feels like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. It does. Why do you think it? Why is that? 
I think a lot of people break in very early. They don't have anything real to write about yet. And then all of a sudden they become fabulously wealthy and they think, well, I guess I must know what I'm doing. So they don't learn anymore. And all they do is they go, oh, this is the diehard moment. Oh, this is a, this is a, this is, this is a uh, Luke, I'm your father moment. And everything's related to the, a lot of people grow up in, in front of screens. And, yes. and, and I mean, so I think that that has a big impact on it. Um, it, I mean, I didn't break into this business until I was in my mid forties. So I, I had was really gonna ask you, yeah. Experience yeah. well, you know. I mean, yes. I'd had three children and Yeah, you had like a normal life, but you always wrote, right? I start I was started writing when I was in college, when I was about eighteen. I was a, I was an art major. I was drawing. Okay. Yeah. I started writing when I was about I took a creative writing class. It's one of those teachers that likes everything, you know? Yeah, so, you know, it's Shereen Hewitt, Shereen Hewitt at Pasadena City College, and she just, you know, oh my God, that was magnificent. It would just be terrible, you know. But you didn't know that, you know. It's encouraging, yeah. <laughs> and she was like the perfect first writing teacher, I guess. Um, but you totally learned to not respect her after about a year, six months in. You're going, oh my God, I'm just going to start deliberately writing bad stuff just to test her, you know. Um, and uh, so started writing when I was about uh, 18, and then I stopped when I was 22. When um, did you I got married, and, and I went oh. to work. And, and I thought, it's time to put away these things. That This isn't real. I bought into well, yeah, everything that, that the world tells you when, you know, try it. You know, and, and, you know, it's not like, it's not like the world is going, you are not going to be an artist. You're going to fail, you know. That's not how the world works. It's the people who love you most are just worried about you. So exactly. when you're 10 and you draw a picture of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, your mother puts it, oh, this is so good. She tapes it to the refrigerator and people come over, come here, look at the picture Danny drew. And oh, oh my God, is that a dinosaur? It's a Tyrannosaurus Rex in the Mars. And you, you know, it's so detailed. He's got scales and everything. And, and you know, and everybody's going. But when you're about 15 or 16 and you're still doing pictures of like anything, you know, um, they're starting to get worried then. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah. oh shit, he actually thinks he can make a living at this. <laughs> we gotta get we gotta get his head in a different space, you know. And yeah. and so they kind of managed it. It was like it was like, yeah, that's not something grown ups do for a living. And so I just stopped and then I started going mad because you can't stop being an artist. You can't stop. It's you can't stop. Exactly. No, if, if you, it's like, yes, yeah, the shark has to swim to yes. the oxygen. If you stop, you go mad. You will go, yes. you, will, you will become very, very unhappy. And that's what happened to me. That's what really fed my depression. And that so, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah, so it's it's sort of like you're kind of stuck. And, and when yeah. people come up to me and they go, yeah, you know, it must be really good being a writer, you know. I've always wanted to be a writer, you know. I want to be a writer. It's like, it's like somebody walking up to me and going, you know, I've always wanted to be a hummingbird or a unicorn. It's like, if you're a writer, you write. you're just stuck with it. That's what you are, you know. If you're an artist, that's what you are. You can't it's, it's not like, do that. It's, I think it's a type of soul. It's the way we're wired or something. Yeah, I mean it's hard baked. I think it's it's it could be. I don't know if it's nurture or nature. I don't know. You know, I mean, I have a few artists in my family. You know, That's what I was going to ask you because I, you know, my mom was a concert pianist, and all my mom's family they were all musicians and very accomplished. So I feel like I got all that artistic, you know. Yeah. Like everybody was like an insurance business. Everybody was my <laughs> uncles. Like, everybody was. My, 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 and then with the generation before that, they were all lawyers and judges. But every oh. once in a while, my family would produce some wackadoodle black sheep that would be like, you know, crazy. 
and yeah. like an artist or something. And and so I guess that, it's my it's my turn in the barrel. It's, it's, it's a mutation of the genetic pool or something, right? Yeah, the family just, is the opposite. If you're decide to be a lawyer or a doctor, you're a mutation because <laughs> we're all crazy. <laughs> well, I was an insurance agent for 22 yeah. years, so I mean, I was able to fake it to some degree. I wore a suit and a tie. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the whole deal. I, I'd give presentations. Oh. I'd stand up in front of large groups of people and explain their benefits. <laughs> oh I, mean, I was actually pretty good. I, I, I remember one guy, guys, one, does this pay for emergency room? And I said, well, if you have an accident, the, the way the deductible is waived, if you have an accident, but if you're sick and you go to the emergency room, you don't have the deductible sent away. If it's an accident waiver, and the guy goes, uh, so if I fell out of a tree, <laughs> would that be uh, covered? Would the, the, the deductible be waived? And I said, yeah. Yeah, if you fell out of a tree and broke your leg or something, yeah. Okay. okay. Then about five questions later, same guy raises his hand. If I trip and hit my head on a coffee table, is that covered? And they go, yeah, yeah, that's covered. And five or six questions go by, a guy raises his hand. By then, I'm just like, oh, God. It's like, if I have a heart attack, is that covered? And I said, well, only if your heart is attacked by the steering column of your car. So. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I had a good time. It actually was kind of, it wasn't a terrible business, but it was not. You know, it wasn't. And, and there, was, there was some creativity involved, but yeah, well, because you made it creative, you know, you made it fun. Uh, yeah. But when you got your big break, so you got what was the first show you sold on the HBO? First thing I sold that was a script. Yes. I sold a short story before that, but that doesn't count. Um, I think I had sixty-two dollars for it. <laughs> that's great yeah and i i did i actually sold a couple of i actually sold a couple of scripts to a a company um that was like a super low budget company that was making movies in the 80s when you could you know you could cobble together all of the licensing and 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 make a movie for you know less than what you cobbled together it was like the wild west back then you know and <laughs> i sold a couple of scripts that didn't get made and then I had a, uh, the first big TV sale I had was, uh, was actually Carnival. Carnival. That was, the, that was the first, and I was still in the insurance business. So I was, you know, that's what I was, that's what my day job was. So the, oh no, 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 I'm sorry. It was Blind Justice. I sold Blind Justice. It was weird when I sold Blind Justice, but that was a movie. And, and when I, that really wasn't, it was TV. Yeah, it was HBO, but it was an HBO movie, you know, and it, and okay. first series television I, you know, I sold was Carnival, but the, the HBO thing, the I mean the, the the Blind Justice thing, I remember going out to the set and being really excited. And, oh, this is really great, you know, wow! And when you go out to a set, it's like it's like being it's like you're you know you're like a guy who is schizophrenic and thinks he's being followed by like black helicopters or something. Yeah. And then you find out you really are being followed. It's like all this is working inside your head. And then all of a sudden you walk on the set. And yeah. It's like there everything is. And there's somebody built it. And it was this was all in my head. Now it's out here. What, what in the world? And and I remember that as I was as I was driving back my first day out in Arizona, um, Apache Junction, Arizona. I'm driving back and I'm going, what if this is the only one I sell? What if this is the only one anybody ever does? You, yeah, that could that across your mind, and it could, it could be, you know. But yeah. tell me about Carnival. You mean well, you, know, you, the, you know the Bradbury Building in L.A.? No. Oh, it's a great building. Um, it was featured in um, uh, uh, what was that? The Harrison Ford movie in the future. It's going blank. They remade it. Please, or, I don't uh, know. Old names. It was. It was. It was. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a brilliant. It's a brilliantly designed and conceived building. It's the only building that I ever made. So I mean, it happens out there, you know. But anyway, so yeah, it went through my mind. It might be the only one I ever sell. 
And for a while, it kind of was. I mean, it was like five, six yeah. years went by before I sold something else. How long did it take from Blind Justice to Carnival? I think it was about 10 years. Oh. Yeah. So you thought, well, that this is it? Did you keep yeah. writing? You kept oh, no, writing? I, just kept, I, kept, I, kept, I, I kept writing. I mean, I kept, yeah. I kept writing. And, and But I, I, was, I didn't really take it that seriously. I was making my living as an insurance broker. So it's right. like... It's like, oh yeah, you know. I mean, I, there was a point I reached. I think it was when I reached my, my, my. When I reached forty, and I went, I told myself, well, if this isn't happening, I'm just going to start writing novels. And uh, I didn't realize I come from a long story line of like really poor losers. <laughs> my brother Paul has a saying. He says. You show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not good losers. No. So That's so I, I, I reached. I reached the point where I was like, well, you know what? I I'm not going to stop doing this, but I am going to start trying to sell them. You know, I never really stepped out. I mean, the, the the blind justice thing was so accidental. I mean, everything about my career has been accidental, but the blind justice thing, the blind justice was Neil Moritz. Neil Moritz has gone on to do all the Fast and Furious movies, and he's in partnership with David, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? He did all the Harry Potter movies, right? So these oh, are two wow. guys who've gone on to do, you know, they've had amazing movies. Um, and and I got I got my brother called me and says, hey, I know this guy, he's a producer, he wants to buy an individual Blue Cross plan. I said, no, I don't do individual work, I just do groups. And he says, yeah, he's a producer. I said, okay. So I met Neil at uh, I met Neil at, at um, Denny's, um, you know, out near Warner Brothers, and I sold a Blue Cross policy, and I kind of got around. I said, yeah, I write, I write screenplays every once in a while, you know. And he said, well, what are you working on now? And I said, I'm working on something about a blind gunslinger. And he goes, oh, well, that's interesting. How far into it are you? And I go, you know, like 35 pages. And he goes, well, when you're done, I'd like to read it. And um, so I go home and I'm looking at it. I, I opened it up because I hadn't looked at it for a while. I've been busy. And I had like 12 pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started writing the thing. And he was calling me up. He was actually calling me up and saying, is it done yet? I really want to read this. Thing. Oh, my God. Um, David Hayne. David Hayne is his partner. And so he and David want to read it. And so, you know, we did this thing. And, and I, I wrote it. And they sold it. And uh, they made it. And, uh, and and it was sort of like a false start because nothing happened after that. You know, I didn't have representation. I did everything wrong. I created a website called unmovies.com. Um, once I kind of, you know, that was basically, I'm going to post all my scripts on here. And this is in the mid 90s, late 90s, I guess. And I post all my scripts, first acts of everything I've ever written, and I'm just gonna. Then I started posting a blog, and there was no word for blog back then; it didn't exist. So right. I'd, I'd say, "What do you call it?" Rant. It wasn't an, I, an article. Seemed too highfalutin for what I was. And all my things were like a, like these long articles about how I'd fucked up, how I'd blown an opportunity, and um, and so that's that's how they found Carnival. It's, it's this. Um, this uh, um, this guy, David, uh, Robert Kaobach, was an assistant to Scott Winant, who was an Emmy-winning producer, and Scott said to him, I'm tired of doctors, lawyers, and cops. Find me something different. <laughs> and he found Carnival, and so I got called to Scott's office, and, and uh, that's how that happened. I just sold it off the internet. That is so cool. I was running. I was. I was basically executive producing uh, a series I created for HBO. So, um, yeah, it was kind of. It was. A, it was scary. It was a very scary transition. Yeah. Why was it scary? I didn't know the rules. I had the skill set, but I didn't know I had the skill set. I mean, I'd been. I'd been. I'd been running a business for for over twenty years. I understood. Mm -hmm. And I've been consulting for people who ran much larger businesses than I ran. Yes. So I, I knew how to 
showroom. I knew how to delegate responsibility, how to choose the right people to delegate it to. I knew how to fire people that didn't do the job. I mean, I was I was a seasoned businessman at that point. Most showrunners don't have a clue as to how to manage um, people um, okay. without being abusive. You know, that's another okay. thing. I mean, I, I learned all that outside the Hollywood system, inside the Hollywood system, all kinds of really bad behavior and unprofessionalism right. is super tolerated. I mean, that would never be tolerated in 10 seconds out in the real world. Um, I don't think so, yeah. And there's a way to fire somebody without making them feel like they should go kill themselves, you know? It, 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 there is, you can't have somebody walk, walk out and have a sense of, of dignity. And ideally, they should walk out when well, that guy's full of shit and I'm sure gonna show him. And it's like, I honestly hope you do someday. I would really love to be kicking myself in the ass but and for us to be laughing over this someday, you know? Um, but, you you know, I can't, yeah, you know, I got 10 people on my team and one of them's not doing his job and I can't ask the other nine to bear that load. It's not fair to them. So um, off you go. Good luck. You know, I, that's, I, I don't say that to them, but that's basically my, my mindset when, when that does happen. Thank God it doesn't happen too often, you know. So what was your role on Carnival? Is you were executive producer? Did you show my role was to hang on by my fingernails and try not, try not to scream? <laughs> <That's a tough laughs> <role>. Yeah. Was, <laughs> uh, yeah. My role on Carnival was they wanted to replace me really badly. And I know why, because um, I'd never done anything. And they were oh betting the farm on the show. This was the most expensive show that they'd ever done by far. Really? Like, Why so? Uh, tons of outdoor locations, uh, tons of extras, mm -hmm. and all those extras had to be cast. You couldn't just do an open call. People, you know, people couldn't show up with gym bodies. People had to look like they lived back then. So all of our extras, if you had 500 extras, they would all be cast. You know, um, that's a lot of cats. You know, they wouldn't read, but you'd be looking at their pictures and getting, you know, having them come in sometimes. All those people had to be made up. They had to have their teeth dirtied down. They all had to be dressed. You know, um, those kinds of things are extraordinarily expensive. Um, weekly television, almost impossible. Um, and back then, you got to understand this is pre Game of Thrones, pre. You know, I mean, now they they got into a period of time. They're kind of coming out of that now, um, yeah. where they would just be spending nine, ten million dollars a week on a show. Well, that's those days are sort of over. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was really expensive. And the guy that they're betting on is a guy who's like a fucking insurance broker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was there, it was an act of utter irresponsibility. <laughs> if I was on the board, I would have fired. Chris Albrecht, like, what kind of an idiot are you? Well, you have to find a show from this idiot, this nobody. But I mean, they bet they they put the bet on me, and they, and they got they get nervous, and I didn't know what my what was appropriate. Like, mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember sending a sending a note, you know, a memo, and um, I, I put everybody I thought needed to get the memo at the top, and. And having one of the having the, one of the executive producers call me up and say, "Don't you know that this name comes after that name and it has to be in this order?" And I didn't understand the whole Kabuki theater of Hollywood yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, and again, outside, nobody gives a shit what order yeah. the names are in, as long as everybody gets the goddamn memo. But in Hollywood, my God, you know, if you put you know Janet, you know, ahead of Gene, oh you my know, God, well, you'll never work for them. Yeah. Are you serious? It's like a caste system or something, right? Oh, it's, it's yeah. And then the work, the mentality management-wise management is like, for a bunch of people who see themselves as, as social progressives, this is where I find it really iron, <laughs> ironic. They see themselves as social progressives, yeah. but their mind, it's like almost a century of management theory has just washed right over them. the idea of no you don't work people 12 hours a day six days a week you're not going to get the best out of people if you do that what no. you have is a lot of workplace accidents 
that's what's going to happen. Or and it, when I when I work on a show, when I, when I run a show, everybody gets in at nine o'clock. The mm -hmm. room opens at ten o'clock. We work through lunch. Um, oh, I shouldn't even say that because I'll get in trouble with my guild. But we, we generally kind of we eat, maybe talk about yeah and talk yeah yeah. Um, but then uh, by six o'clock, everybody's going home. I mean, that's we work. Nice. It's it's an eight hour day, and yeah. and and that just it's like that's so that when everybody comes in the next morning, they're going to be operating on eight cylinders, you know. Whereas, yeah, you could do that thing where you stay up till two in the morning trying to work out some imaginary kink that you think you have in the story, which nobody else sees except for you because you're suffering from sleep deprivation and you can drag everybody down into your own little personal neurotic hell. And then they all show up the next day at 10 o'clock. They, 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 they limp in and they can't think anymore. So now they're on two cylinders and you're going to get less done the next day. It's just, nobody does that anymore. Nobody out in the real world does that. No, you know? And so it's like, yeah, no, there's things I see in in this business that make no sense to me at all about just the way yeah. they work people, you know? Yeah, it's I mean, some things are unavoidable. Like when you're in production, yeah, because you have this, you know, it's, it's, it's very expensive and you can't, you know, you can't just shut down after eight hours. Sometimes you've got to work 12. It's just, but... Um, but not on a regular basis. It's like sometimes there are circumstances where you, they need to stay, right? And that's okay. Yeah, but that should always be the exception, not the rule. The exception, that's true. Yeah. Exactly. That's the way those those work rules are developed by the unions is as exceptions. If, if it becomes the rule, it means somebody's not doing their job. And the buck stops with the showrunner. At the end of the day, every, anything that's going wrong or going south is your fault, period. Okay. Like, you know, yeah. you, and there's nothing to me more despicable than a showrunner who tries to blame things on other people. It's like, oh, the network did this, the network did that. And it's yeah. like, you know what? You just chose, you chose the wrong hill. You just decided not to die on that hill, and you should have died on that hill. You know, <laughs> there's shows that, you know, there were, that, that you know, early on maybe decisions were made that this is the way it's going to be and it was counter to the way the show should have been and that was your job you know yeah yeah, yeah. do you find that people in this business sometimes are a little bit more cruel than yeah, more cruel they're cruel yes and no yes this is showbiz it's mm -hmm. a glamour business um it draws it draws extreme people. Yeah. Um, and by extreme people, yes, I have met a lot of psychopaths and sociopaths mm -hmm. in this business, mm -hmm. but I have also met just as many people who are extraordinarily kind. Yes. And the trick is to not do business with, with psychopaths horrible people <laughs> and try to do business with all of the nice people you know absolutely and we know who we are i mean you get into conversations with people you go oh yeah he's one of us okay yeah she's one of us she's okay you know and so you just it's like um and that's true of everybody up and down the line from the you know caterer to the lead to the showrunner to the to the studio person i've got great people who work for studios and they're not well yeah uh, you know uh, not i mean not it's a weird it's a weird job it's a, it's a terrifying it job. i think more so than, than writing probably you, you know? write yeah it yeah. is i mean you're certainly more replaceable <laughs> definitely yes <laughs> as replaceable as writers are you know yes absolutely and okay here nate by the way is saying i love carnival so thank you so much oh well, the, you're welcome thank you for watching you should have had your friends watch too but we'd still be on <laughs> it's all your fault it? it's all your fault oh my god you know it's so, so funny you would get these and i i do appreciate that people would people would 
they get involved. I remember having a conversation with somebody at HBO, and they were going, well, we don't quite understand if we got, you know. They were just, they. what happened with Carnival, they were expecting, they were expecting Sopranos numbers. They honestly were. They actually really? thought, oh, this show's going to be a bigger, popular success than the Sopranos. And and they were convinced of that. And okay. I remember when I first heard them say, when one of the producers came to me and said, yeah, they think this is going to be bigger than the Sopranos. I went, oh, my God, we're fucked. <laughs> the pressure. <laughs> well, I just, I, the thing is, I knew, the, first of all, the Carnival's a genre show. And yeah. there are people that where genre, it's kind of like, you know, they don't like genre. The, the, something, the minute the band puts his hands on that girl and heals her, they go, that can't happen. That's fake. You know, <laughs> Superman, he can't. How can he fly? He has no aerodynamic properties whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, it's, he's, hey, he wouldn't be able to fly. What is a cape supposed to work for him? What's going on here? How does he turn? Like, <laughs> you know, it's like there's just people who just don't, they don't like genre. It's like people who don't like country western music or jazz. It's yeah. Like, you can go, oh, I'm going to tell you something. You don't like jazz? Let me play you some Bobby Coltrane. You'll love that. They just don't have an ear for it. It doesn't matter to them. So it's, it's not their cup of tea. And so I knew when a large part of your audience is is that. Whereas you're doing a, a straight up, people who like genre stuff also generally can tolerate a straight up drama. Mm -hmm. But they're, you know, it doesn't work the other way around. You know, the Venn diagram doesn't support that, you know. So I knew they, their expectations were through the roof and that we would never meet them. And, and we didn't. And so, uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> bye, Mike. Uh, so what was the next uh, show that you worked on? Thanks for playing. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your case of rice -a -roni. Go have a career somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> So what was the next thing after Carnival? Well, after Carnival, it was really weird. Um, I had a period of time where, see, because I'd come out of like the clear blue, I mean, I, I hadn't worked my way up. I hadn't ever been on any show. Well, I was on a show briefly while I was waiting for Carnival, uh, while I was waiting for the pilot to get greenlit. I was on a show called uh, Wolf Lake, and that only lasted like six episodes um, with Alex Gonzo. He's a wonderful guy, great show on and I learned a lot from him. And, um, but then it was the first time I was ever in a room. I'd never been in a room, a writer's room together with people. And, and, um, and so, so uh, it was, um, after it went off the air, nobody knew who I was. And there was actually, like, it's still on IMDb. There's actually a rumor going around that I was a uh, pseudonym for David Lynch, which was like, what? really flattering because david lynch is like one of my biggest influences and heroes and i love him i mean I, i've read his books and I, I, i've never met the man but i, I think he's un, unbelievably wonderful and um but it's not great for your brand <laughs> it's really? like, where did that yeah. come from so i mean the next thing i did i guess i i managed i got an episode of supernatural yes you know i did that and then nice. um i was on staff with um something called my own worst enemy in the meantime i'm trying to sell other shows um and i'm getting some development deals and i'm doing that that thing um uh, and um you know the, so i did spartacus for a while um i did a an anthology series called my own or uh uh, what is it? I think it, oh, Fear Itself. I've got it's over there. I've got a poster. Um, I was basically just, what I was doing was I was doing all the things that I would have done if I was working. I did all, I worked my way up in retrospect. You know what I mean? It was like, I lucked out magnificently when I got the carnival thing, which was just explosively, just ridiculously lucky. A series of just stars lining up in, I mean, a, a crazy way. You know, I mean, HBO today would not be like Carnival. 
HBO was at that point in time. It's like, okay, we're looking actively looking for shit that nobody else would green light ever. Yes, you know, and and a lot of people didn't understand that mandate. And but HBO fit the bill perfectly. So this is brilliant, but nobody in, in the right mind would ever do this show. And so they they did it, and um, it was. Uh, so so like i skipped a lot i skipped about 20 years of just you know clawing my way up to that position <laughs> and then i kind of seen 20 years since i've just basically been doing all that all that yeoman work you know um I've, you I've run run a couple of shows i've been an executive producer on a couple of shows like the black the network stuff i've done the cable stuff you know yeah the blacklist you were were you a showrunner or executive producer? No, the showrunner on that was John Heisendrath. And I worked with John on a show called My Own Worst Enemy with Christian Slater that was on. For, I mean, if you blinked, you missed it. <laughs> and, you know, if you blinked and missed it, you blinked at exactly the right time, trust me. <laughs> I don't think it was our finest hour. It, it was, it, but to be fair to John, he didn't create it. Who the guy who created it? Really, it was badly conceived. It was a badly conceived show. And why so? Well, the whole idea was it was this. Uh, the idea was kind of neat. Okay, a guy is by by night. I think there's a show that's coming on that's like this. It's somewhere in the Netflix, Amazon arena. It's about a guy who, by basically, he's gone through some sort of weird government program where he's been brainwashed to completely dissociate one one side of his personality from the other, like Doctor Jekyll, and Mr. Hyde. Essentially, oh, wow. Doctor Jekyll, Doctor, Doctor Jekyll, Mr. Hyde story. And Dr. Jekyll is like this, you know, this dad, you know, who's got a job and a home and this and that. And Mr. Hyde is like, you know, this this this, this super spy, um, uh, sort of super spy assassin guy. Ooh. And that all kind of track. We could have done that show, but they came up like, well, the, the whole department is that. So you, you had like, you know, you had like other characters for that one. Well, just yeah. to balance all that. And okay, who is he now? Who, who it was, it, you know. And I even even like just sitting down with John and saying, you know, we, we what we should do is we should we should go to a completely different palette when he's, you know, Mister Hyde. You know, lean into the blues and then go a little bit warmer and color temperature when he's. You know, something to give the audience a clue that right now he's seeing the world as Mr. Hyde. Right now he, you know, it would really be what, you know, because otherwise you'd have these things where it's like, how do you dramatize him flipping back into, you know, a suburban dad mode in the middle of a mission, you know? And yeah, it was just really, really hard to do. So it failed. It was, it was a plane that, it's like one of those things, you know, it's like, Remember, there was a show when I asked you to remember it. You know, you're far too young. But there was a show called Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. Um, and it had this thing called the Flying Sub. And it was this, looked like a manta ray. It would fly and then it would crash into the water. It was a sub. And it's like, well, why don't, they want to, why don't they build one of those things? Well, because subs are really heavy. They have to withstand pressure. And planes are really light. This was like the flying sub. I don't understand me. It, just, it didn't work underwater and it didn't fly. So John, John, uh, John, I just finished Dracula. I show, I show ran Dracula for NBC with uh, John Rhys Myers, and it was a wonderful, really. I was very proud of what we've done with Dracula, and but you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything I'm proud of. Cause, and so John said, we were, I was working for NBC with Dracula and, and, and the Blacklist is on NBC and John was a big fan from my days with him on uh, My Own Worst Enemy. And he, so he immediately called me and said, I really want you to be on the show. And I said, okay. So he introduced me to the creator, John Bokenkamp, 
and we all got along and then they just put me to work and I was on the show for like three years. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, wrote some, wrote a lot, rewrote a lot. Um, I did a lot of, a lot of work on that show in those three years. Um, and uh, I was an exec, I was a co, I was like a co-exec the first two years as an executive producer, I think the last year. And uh, by the time I finished though, I just, I needed to work on something I created. I, I just couldn't, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, hey, you know, I'm almost 60 and, you know, I really want to get a few more shows on the year. And so that's been my focus since then is, is not doing, uh, not doing work on other people's shows. Or other people. Or helping other people co-creating with people. I've been doing yeah. a lot of that. You know? Did you, okay, so tell me about the rising, because you were telling me yesterday when we were talking, and it's fascinating. I, I love that you, you seem to have like a thing for the supernatural a little bit, don't you? Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that we don't, I think that, yeah, I think there's things we, we that are, that exist that we can't explain. And, and yeah. a lot of people sort of brush it aside as bunk. And a lot of it, frankly, is bunk, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I got, I, 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 I actually campaigned hard for this job. Um, and it was, it's with Lux Vide, which is an Italian company. They do these very lush historical dramas for the international, for international television, all over the, they shoot them generally in English. Nice. And they're all over the world. They do great work. Um, and um, Da Vinci and uh, the, the, the um, um, oh God, I'm trying to think of the name. I just went completely blank. Um, the Medici's, you know, um, just really, really lush, beautiful stuff. And, and they were going to do uh, the life of Christ, and I said, "I've I, at this point in my life, I thought, I think I want to try to tackle that, and because it's been the way that it's been done in the past, it's like it's like a pageant. You do, uh, I always say it's like there's sh a lot of superhero movies are pageants. There's nothing. There's no plot there. It's just a series of sequences." You know, that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the stakes are set at the beginning. And then there's this very thin thread of narrative that goes and connects up all these big, giant sequences. It's the equivalent of maybe going to, you know, if you were in ancient Rome and you go to a show at the Colosseum, there'd be some sort of like a theme. Well, okay, today we're going to have, you know, people getting eaten by wild animals first. And then we'll have, you know, fake battle second. You know, <laughs> that's not really a narrative in the traditional sense of three act structure. It's like a fireworks show. There's a narrative there. It builds. You know, other than it building, and that's what the Jesus shows had always been. It's like, okay, now here's the, you know, uh, this is a, this is the scene of the the manger, Bethlehem. You know, the birth of Jesus, so, and here is this. And I was like, I kind of like said, I don't want to do that. I, what I want to, what I want to do is 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 work with is work with these characters as like real people, like with real emotions. It makes sense that we can connect with. And that, what was it like? What did Mary and Joseph and Jesus talk about over dinner? Well, <laughs> I mean, what what kind of relationship did he have with his mother? She's only 15 years older with, than him when he died. It, she's exactly. almost his. She's almost his contemporary. That must have. She, she was almost a collaborator. She knew, and and taking you know one of the rules is okay. Everything that's supernatural, virgin birth, um, you know all the things, the miracles. Is, I'm going to say these happen. Okay, uh, that's what is in scripture. It says this. This is the story yeah. that I'm telling. I'm not going to go. Oh well, I'm going to write him as just a human being, you know, and then all the rest of the stuff is imaginary. So I'm going to throw it all out. That's not, that's not my take. My take is yeah. looking at it and going, no. But what what was it like? What was it like to feed a multitude with with, with you know, some loaves and bread? How desperate did you have to be? I mean, what about the wedding at Cana when he turned? Now that was a really early miracle. Like, that's his first yeah. miracle, and it's like. 
wow, that was sort of like, it's one of the few miracles Jesus did that was self-serving. I presume he drank the wine. I mean, think about how, <laughs> it's like, oh, my friends are out of wine. I'll make some more. I mean, <laughs> really, that's, that's, I'm sure that God was going, hey, look, that's not what this is about, man. You know, um, God, God was going, no, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it, what was, you know, what was his relationship like with John the Baptist and, and, and yeah. his, and, and his apostles. So the first season, the entire first season, and usually with this, again, with, you know, say Jesus shows, he's, you know, Jesus show, shows about Jesus. It'll be like Jesus and Peter and maybe James or Paul and then a bunch of other guys. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, these was, these guys weren't just hanging out with them. They weren't just, hey, you know, it's not like an entourage. <laughs> it's, it, it's like they had jobs. They they had functions, and they were putting on uh, the equivalent back then of, of a rock show. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, there had to be advancement. It would go out and say, "Oh, yeah, you know what? There's pretty heavy, you know, Roman presence in this city. We probably want to steer clear of these guys." Um, oh, okay, over here, this is a better place. Oh, they're going to look at logistics. We've got a number of people. We've got 500 people following us. We've got another 1,500 people are going to show up. We need to find a venue where 2,000 people can be seated comfortably, where they can all hear you. I mean, these are these are real things that Absolutely. have been going on, and you don't see any of that. And and so each one of these guys had a job. And I want to know. I mean, the miracle of calling the apostles to me, like the way it's depicted most most of these shows is like, you know, Peter's fixing his nets, you know, Jesus walks <laughs> and he says, Simon Peter, follow me. And he looks up and he turns into a Jesus zombie. They, they all turn up, oh. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yes, master. And I don't think that's how it went down. I just, sorry, <laughs> that does, that does, <laughs> yeah. the, you know, the idea of Jesus, I'm sure he was capable of completely subsuming somebody's will you know, but that's kind of like the other guy's job. I don't think that's what Jesus was really about. I think the real miracle is Jesus approached each one of these men at a point in their lives where they would say yes. And so what I want to do is show, okay, where was, where was Philip at in his life? What was going on in his life? So that when Jesus shows up in the third act and says, follow me, it makes total sense for Philip to go, okay you know and that that's the miracle the miracle is jesus recognizing i don't think you know there was always that guy in high school who says hey if you ask every girl you meet to go to bed with you you know one will <laughs> you know, one in a hundred i don't think jesus was going around going follow me and people were going take a pass on that one guy you know he wasn't, he wasn't hitting everybody up you know, you know uh, that's so, hilarious that's yeah. awesome. That's exactly yeah. true. <laughs> but I, I mean, I, what I want to do is 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 look and ground these these things that are. You look at the you look at you look at the situation, and you look at it from a human perspective. In mm -hmm. the stoning of the adulteress, for instance, yeah, people are in they're in the middle of 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 killing this person with rocks. Okay, a mob. Killing yeah. a, a fellow human being, a defenseless human being with rocks, okay? I don't think of anything that you could step into that would be more terrifying than to try to yeah. intercede on the innocent person's. You know, but yeah. what it's done in the thing, what happens? She's being stoned, and Jesus steps in and says, Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And everybody just goes and throws those Jesus zombie faces. And they <laughs> drop their rocks and they just, they just, you know, move off. And I go, that's not what happened that day. What happened that day was he said, I can't let, he started to move and the other apostles are probably trying to stop him. Are you out of your mind? You know? <laughs> I love that. They'll yes. kill you. They will kill you. Yes. And I'm sure the rocks didn't stop right away either. I'm sure that maybe one or two hit Jesus before he got, got out the words, you know? And, and, and he must have been an incredibly compelling person 
to make them stop that, you know? Yes. Um, and that's on the order of a miracle. That's maybe it's just being so flabbergasted by somebody's courage that you are ashamed, you know, which I think is more only more what happened that day, you know? And, and so I just wanted to depict those things, you know, and, and by depicting them in a human, on a human level, on a emotionally human level, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden people are seeing the story for the first time, which is really structurally, it's a superhero story, really, at the end of the day. It's, and, and there's a reason for that. It's because, you know, the guys who created Superman, you know, they were basically rehashing Jesus' story. So, you know. I never thought about that. Oh, yeah. So, so most superhero stories are, are you know, are, 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 um, are really retelling. Most, it's, it's the Campbellian thing. It's the, it's the same story over and over again, different, you know, the um, hero of a, what is it, a thousand faces. You know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So here, look, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna give you a shout out here, Nate Daniel. Off my mind, um, it's just blown. I'm just loving the show today. Ah, thank you, Nat, Nate. Uh, your money is in the mail. Uh, uh, where do I send the check? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So uh, one question that I really am always curious to know about artists is like, you know how we all want to quit at some point, right? We're like, fuck the shit. So what do you do when you go fuck the shit? What, how do you go back? Is it because you have to, because you have no choice, because you're an artist, or do you talk yourself into it? How do you do this? I think a lot of people go into teaching. Yeah, maybe feel like you're doing it without doing it. Yes, you know? and to get a regular paycheck. Um, I don't know how. There's a point you reach where you've developed this pretty much where you've done a lot. And you know, like I'm kind of at a point now where I go, you know what? I'd love to have enough put aside to just start painting again. You know, mm, um, nice. so so I think a lot of artists channel their talents into another realm um, and, 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 and pick up, start, you know, whether they pick up uh, paint brushes or, you know, you, you, when you get tired, when you, you feel like you've been doing the same, where they just change it up big time. Like I was listening to Matthew uh, O'Connor. Um, I, uh, I was listening to books on tape, his, his okay. biography, and he had just done all these rom-coms and he got, he got tired of it. And, and he told his agents, I'm just not gonna do this anymore. And they were offering yeah. him ungodly amounts of money to do them and he said no. And then finally he just, he changed his career up, you know? Um, so I guess there's that. Some, some, people just, some people just stop. I mean, Cary Grant just stopped. I mean, the, 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 the rumor is Cary Grant was one of the early people and he was in psychotherapy. And this may be total bullshit. could be a complete urban myth. Please, wow. the state of Cary Grant, don't come after me. I just heard this. But he was one of the first people who was, who was treated with LSD in a therapeutic environment. Oh, and my God. And then he quit uh, acting. And I have this feeling that Cary Grant just had a trip and he goes, oh, this is all. Bullshit. <laughs> like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. <laughs> this character is absurd. I'm done. <laughs> so as, as, as I, you can hear me do a shitty carry brain. <laughs> no, it's funny though. <laughs> so, as a very accomplished writer, what advice would you give to like new writers or people who want to do Quit. it professionally? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, like let's assume that they write every day, okay? Like no, uh, that they uh, haven't uh, made it yet. There's a couple ways to do. There's a couple ways to make a career if you want in television, especially. Um, yeah. Uh, in television, there's almost like a, a journeyman type approach. You can come in, 
First, it helps to go to an Ivy League college um, or one of three film schools, you know, NYU, UCLA, USC. We don't know who they are. If you graduate, you'll make contacts. Those contacts will be very valuable to you, and you'll be able to sort of help each other out. And you're kind of leapfrogging each other and building each other up as you're moving through. And it's very, and then you get your first job, and it's a writer's assistant, and you're getting people coffee, and you're in the room, and you're taking notes. And then maybe you begin to become a baby writer and get a job as a story editor and you go through that process and then you're on staff and then you do this. And that all that whole process starts when you're probably 22 years old and just graduated from college. Um, I, I, I would say if you want to make a living, uh, that's a great way to make a living. If you want to do something extraordinary, what you should do is just fuck college, um, go stick your thumb out and hit the road and meet interesting people, do interesting things. Go to jail once or twice. That's good. Not, not for, don't, go to the, don't go to prison. That's probably not good. But it that's doesn't good. do you, you know, it's, it's not a night in the drunk take, probably is not. <laughs> um, it, uh, live, your, live, live your life. Get married, get divorced. Get your heart broken. Yes. You know, be with somebody when they die. Yeah. Watch them through the process. Mm -hmm. um, have tragedies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because then what you do is you get through that, and you've got something to write. Watch, 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 watch somebody give birth to your child. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a good one. Um, grow. Watch a child grow. Make mistakes. Make lots of mistakes. Um, uh, wish you could do things over again and 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 then when you do get a chance to do them over again do them right you know it, it, what i mean is live draw breath and do that for a decade before you even think about picking up a fucking pen write go ahead and write write about yeah. it. a journal do whatever you need to do write sto short stories and stuff that's great but i i really think that the world is just too full of people that are basically just rewriting things that have been they've watched on tv on their phone um in a movie theater um that the, you need to write from and you need to write from experience because that's where the specificity comes from that's where real specificity comes from that's where when you're writing something you're writing it from in a way that nobody's ever written it and and you in the 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 the, the the most important thing, the I mean, the gold standard in drama, the gold standard in drama, is this thing called the ecstasy of recognition. I don't know if you've heard that term. I never um, heard that. It's the ecstasy of recognition. What that is is when you're sitting with a bunch of strangers in a theater, and you're watching something unfold on a screen, and it takes your breath away because you're going. I had no idea that anybody else had ever felt this before. Yeah. You see a reaction to an event or the way a person is now, and, and everything kind of comes together, the acting, the writing, the direction, everything comes comes together, and it just rips your heart. You just, you're going, that was my secret. I thought I was the only one who went through my dad's clothes and smelled them the night he died after his funeral, you know, I mean, I, I thought I was the only one who, the, these secrets, these, these things, these secret things that I thought was just me. And then you realize it wasn't just me, it was whoever wrote that, and it was the actor, it was the director, and they all had that, and that, and you turn around and you see other people in the theater and they're reacting the same way you are, and you realize they all had that. We all had that. Right. And it connects you with everyone in that in that theater as a human being you're connected as a human being and it comes down to you know it's easy to have somebody cry about something oh, somebody died you know it's easy to do something same but to have that specificity of reaction and you have to have lived it you have to be writing from from, from the standpoint of the the worlds in your own emotional fingerprints that needs to make it onto the screen and if you don't have those experiences 
you have nothing to write about what but what somebody yeah. said or somebody other some some other person wrote and your stuff will be as compelling as a xerox of a xerox of a xerox of a xerox of the mona lisa it's it's like a comic telling internet jokes instead of telling jokes that come from them you yeah. know what I mean? and there are yeah. some you know and, and they're programmed to tell those jokes and we're yeah. programmed to laugh because we know what the cue is to laugh yeah but you know you get you, you you start to study it and you become much a much harder sell. Like I'm terrible to watch TV with. My wife, we were watching something, and I was just sitting there and watching. It. And finally, I just turn around over here and I go, "Honey, two scenes from now, a doctor is going to." <laughs> give the parents diagnosis that their child has leukemia. <laughs> she goes, oh, what do you mean? Have you seen this? I said, no, but I just know it's going to happen. And then it's like two scenes later, and the doctor says, your son, you know, we ran the test, we got the results, and he has you know, lymphoma, do, 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 leukemia. And I'm just going, yeah. And my wife is going, you're an asshole. I never want to watch anything with you ever again. <laughs> you screw it up for everyone. <laughs> yeah, you just you, you do this. It's like those guys who design magic tricks for David Copperfield. They know exactly how everything's done, and you know it's like they probably died for a new way to new illusion, a new way to come up with something. And that's kind of what we do. You know, we want. To bring something, somebody you want you want to touch people. You want to fake it. You don't want to do a chump bait. You don't want to pretend somebody's died and everybody knows they didn't die because it's only second act. And of course they're coming back. You know, yeah. I mean, there's so much of that, and you know, it's like of course that that character's not dead. You know, um, you you know it's that it's chump bait and it's empty calories. You know, I, I don't just don't. Why waste time writing that shit? Let other people write that shit. That's what I want. Let Sorry other people write that. that shit. That, did you hear that? What was that? That's uh, some idiot, some asshole, just, just I don't know, speeding. I used to live on the, on the peninsula at Marina del Rey. Yeah. And once every year, somebody would drive off the end of that peninsula into the bay. Oh, my God. speed. <laughs> <laughs> it's really amazing. I hear the oh, car go by, and you know, there's not enough room left in this freaking peninsula. And then you hear, and <laughs> the dummies always survive, too. I mean, they, you know, you get pretty, they, just, they just go ragdoll when they hit the water. Oh, my God. Um, anyway. Do you have any other questions, kids? You know, I, I really think I think you can I think you can go to film school, but do the, yeah. just live for a while before you before you start bothering us. Nobody yeah. wants nobody you know <laughs> if you're gonna if you want to expand your horizons beyond how sad you were when your first dog died, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Live, for God's sake. I know, right? <laughs> no, no, but really, seriously, you can you can speed that up by making sure you surround yourself with interesting people. Meet interesting people. Yeah. Interesting people tell interesting stories. Yes. And um, you can, you, and it's not cheating if somebody tells you something that happened to them. Absolutely you know? not. Yeah. No. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it's meet a lot of interesting people, and you know, um, and and and. Take an acting class. That's a good thing. That's take, good. Take, yeah. Take, just take risks. You know, um, do silly things. <laughs> yeah. Go and, and have really dumb day jobs. Go to work for a brake line in factory or something. You know, <laughs> just. I mean, I, I can. I worked at a car wash for God's sake. And I, I still draw material from all kinds of stupid jobs I had. There's nothing wrong with all those jobs. You're not, you know, it's really sad. Like, oh, I'm totally wasting my time. No, you're not, because there is no such thing as wasted time. As long as you're experiencing something, mm -hmm. you know, that's all grist for the mill, everything. You, we eat the whole buffalo 
we eat the whole buffalo. I don't think there's, you know, you just, and the longer it takes for you to break through, the more buffalo you got to eat. And you don't want to run out of buffalo, you know, because then you end up being a burned out hack uh, at, at 40 or 45. And I don't really want to do that. Yeah. You know, you're going to be rich, though. So I guess there's that. Yeah. yeah. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm neither. I'm neither burned out nor am I rich. Which is cool. <laughs> Love it. Uh, do you have any regrets? Sometimes I. Sometimes I. I had a next door neighbor who was an admin. Um, and he came. He had me over. I was like 17 years old. Benny, why don't you come over? And he sat me down in the backyard out by his pool, you know, and he says, I just wanted to tell you that I still have quite a lot of pull with the U.S. Navy. And if you want to go to Annapolis, I'd probably be able to get you in there. And at the time, I was like this hippie. <laughs> you know, long years, dope smoking, high school idiot. And I'm going, <laughs> yeah, really? Annapolis, like I'm gonna go to a military academy, like screw that. <laughs> and, like there's days where I go, yeah, it might have been good. <laughs> I probably would have been like there. Um, I, other than that, nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. That's great. So yeah, you I, I, every bit. I've had some terrible things um, that you know that, that would be you know redlined as tragedy, and I've had things I don't regret a, a thing. I don't regret the fact that I. I did made so many mistakes on my road to getting into the business. I'm glad it took me as long as I did. Um, I, uh, I mean, I really don't. The certainly not from a career standpoint. From a personal standpoint, maybe one or two. But you know, I'm not going to share those with you. No, you don't have to. <laughs> Other than Minneapolis. So this is all the last question. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> This is the last question I always ask my guests. Uh, what do you want to be known for? A really impeccable body of work. Nice. Yeah, I mean, just where people go, yeah, yeah, this guy brought it. He brought it every yeah. time. Because uh, I don't have a B game. I, I, I don't know. I don't have a B game. I, I can't. I don't know how to go, eh, I'm just going to half ass it. You know, I, I just don't know how to do it. I, I, I pour myself into everything I do. And by the time, nice. even when I take a job that's a money job, by the time I'm done, it's not a money job anymore. I'm, I'm in love with it, you know? And so, um, yeah. yeah. I love that. So you're all or nothing. Like you just go for it. Yeah, just where other, other writers go, yeah, that guy, he really, you know, everything turned his hand to, did a good job on it. You know? Good. And, yeah. That would be it. That's great. That's a great answer. I love it. Well, we've been talking for like an hour and a half. I we know. Right through the hour. What but do you it's do? not like that's 10 minutes. Shows? <laughs> that's like two shows. Yeah. They just cut out all the stupid stuff and you'll have about 45 minutes. <laughs> Nothing was stupid in this interview. <laughs> Zero. Uh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Say hi yeah. to Barney for me. I will. Well, he says hi too because I. But he him said him. hi on the. He sent me a text. I, I mentioned. Oh, he did. He, yeah. Oh, she's great. Yeah. Oh, I love Barney. He's so awesome. Well, good luck with your show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, talking about experience. <laughs> That's semi autobiographical. So yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I've well, <laughs> the three of us will have the three of us will have virtual drinks. Yes. <laughs> yes, we definitely should do that. It's been a pleasure. Thank oh, you. Thank you so much for doing my little podcast. You've been amazing. And I just, you're very inspiring. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anyway, you guys take care. Yes. And thank, on podcast land. Yes. And, and thank you, Grace. everybody, for watching. And, and the comments are great. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you, Daniel. And, um, uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. All right. I hope so. Take All care. right. Oh, you too. Bye. Bye.